All right, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Miss Jessica Finn. And I'm Miss Kelly Van Horn. Uh, and we would like to thank you so much for coming to our first ever virtual science research symposium. Uh, we hope that you and your families are doing well during this very crazy time. And we really do appreciate you taking the time out of your day uh, to come and join us and help us to celebrate our seniors and showcase all of the work that they've done uh, in the science research program. Uh, the seniors uh, who are in the program, they've been working really hard on their research for the past three years that they've been in the program. And uh, even though we can't come together as uh, one whole group and have our traditional kind of symposium, we are really, really ecstatic that we are able to celebrate them um, and what they've been able to accomplish in this kind of virtual setting uh, tonight. So again, we, I thank you so much and uh, we hope that you enjoy. So as Ms. Finn said, this is our first ever virtual symposium and we really do appreciate everyone coming out to see all the work our students have done given the current circumstances. This evening, the juniors in our program will introduce the senior presenters. While the students are presenting, you can type any questions you may have into the Q&A and the students will answer all questions at the end of their presentations. Um, so up next is Andrew Parisi, and he'll be uh, talking about his experience at the Walkman Institute Summer Experience Program and his publication of Landovia Punk Data Clone, WA11AP3.19. Uh, he'll be going to Brande University as a quantitative research me fellow and uh, he'll be um, presenting in the format of a poster. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Shrikar, for introducing me. So uh, here is my presentation on um, my Landoltia punctata clone WA11AP3.19, which was a casein kinase 2 subunit alpha 2-like mRNA sequence, and um, a general overview of my experience at the Waxman Institute Summer Experience Program. Um, Okay, so basically to start off, um, the Waxman Institute Summer Experience Program is a two-week experience over the summer that focuses on the isolation, um, characterization, and DNA sequence analysis of genes from the duckweed Landoltia punctata and um, how these compare to those found in other species. Um, at the end of the program, we all published our clones to the National Center for Biotechnology Information. Um, so duckweed is a small, fast-growing, uh, flowering aquatic plant that grows in fresh water. Many scientists believe that it can be used as a potential biofuel source, as it contains 40 to 70 percent starch, or be used um, in bioremediation to extract nitrogen and phosphate from wastewater. And um, Landoltia punctata is a species of duckweed. It was once classified as Spiridella punctata, but in 1999, D.H. Less and D.J. Crawford proposed segregating it into its own genus of Landoltia. So as you can see here, is my, uh, this is my first figure, and it's um, depicting the, the third clone I published, which coded for casein kinase 2, and that's what this presentation will be on. And, sorry. And um, my second figure is a cladogram depicting the different species of duckweed. Um, the second one from the top is Landoltia punctata. And that will be what, um, again, what I use during the experiment. So um, the objective during this program was to find similarities between Landoltia punctata clones and other organisms through their DNA and protein structures using bioinformatics. So um, first I'll start off with the methodology. Um, DNA libraries are random collections of DNA fragments from an organism cloned um, into a vector or a small circular DNA molecule that replicates inside a bacterium, for example, E. coli. Um, they can be manipulated in order to isolate a DNA fragment of interest. 
in order to plate the Landoltia punctata cDNA or a copy of RNA in the form of DNA library, we first grew the bacteria colonies with each containing a random unique cDNA insert. Once the bacteria colonies formed, you would pick a white colony as, at random as the blue colonies had no cDNA insert. So as you can see here, um, this is basically a figure showing the process of making a cDNA library. So you started at the, with your chromosomal DNA and then you go um, to through transcription for your mRNA. And from there you get a copy of the mRNA as cDNA and you ligate those fragments into a plasmid. Then the cells replicate and you um, basically just plate the colonies and you end up with something looking like this, which is my fourth figure showing the plating of a Landoltia punctata cDNA library. As I mentioned before, the blue colonies had no cDNA insert. It was also important to um, choose the correct size of um, the colonies because you didn't want one that was too big as it may contain more than one cDNA insert or too small as there may be no cDNA insert. Um, next, we used a polymerase chain reaction or a PCR in order to determine the size of the cDNA insert using agarose gel electrophoresis. The insert, according to the PCR, had the primer ends, so it was important to subtract 200 base pairs from the total to find the actual size of the insert. And this can be seen here. So these are my results from the polymerase chain reaction, depicting that the third clone had a predicted cDNA insert size of 1200 base pairs and I found that as this right here shows about 1400 base pairs and as I mentioned before you just subtract the 200 base pairs to get your predicted cDNA insert size. Um, finally we used a restriction digest in order to compare the sizes of the inserts with the PCR and prepare the DNA for analysis and other processing in order to find the actual size of the insert from the restriction digest. Instead of subtracting 200 base pairs like you would in the polymerase chain reaction, you must subtract 700 base pairs. And this can be seen in my sixth figure which are my results from the restriction digest. These results confirmed the results from the polymerase chain reaction as they both showed uh, insert sizes of about 1,200 base pairs. And again, this is around 1,900, and you subtract 700 to get your 1,200 base pairs. Um, now for my results. After sequencing the insert, I found that it was actually 1090. 1090 base pairs, meaning that I probably made an overestimate while I was um, analyzing the PCR and the restriction digest. Um, after that, I analyzed the results using a BLAST-N, which searches a nucleotide database using a nucleotide carry in order to check for similarities between sequences. So as you can see here, this is figure my seventh figure, which shows a small portion of the sequence from my Landoltia punctata clone. And this is the eighth figure, which showed the results from the blast end, showing the similarities between my clone's nucleotide sequences and others. So um, as you can see, all it's shown in red, and that means that mine was very similar to other nucleotide sequences, meaning it was highly conserved throughout many organisms. Next, I found the open reading frame, or ORF, of the clone, which gives a protein sequence for the clone. Unfortunately, I found that it was not the complete sequence for the protein as it did not contain the start codon, but it did contain 941 base pairs of the total um, 1,090 base pairs. Next, I analyzed the results using both a BLAST-X, which searched the protein databases using a translated nucleotide carry, and a BLAST-P, which searched the protein databases using a protein carry from the ORF to check for similarities of the sequences. I found that the sequences coded for the protein, as I mentioned before, casein kinase 2, which is a serine threonine selective protein kinase, or a protein that adds a phosphate group to serine or threonine. Additionally, it is found in all cells and is necessary for survival, as it is highly conserved and expressed in many organisms, including humans. So, um, here's my ninth figure showing the structure of casein kinase 2. The alpha helices are depicted in pink and the beta strands are in yellow. Um, this is my tenth sh figure showing the interactions between casein kinase 2 and 
for unidentified proteins. Unfortunately, the program that I was using didn't have any information regarding the other four proteins. And here is my 11th figure showing the expression of casein kinase 2 in the plant and cell. As you can see, um, it is highly expressed in the mature pollen as that is where it is um, red and that shows that it is very highly expressed there. And it is also highly expressed in the chloroplast as it is a darker color than the um, rest of the cell. Um, Next is the discussion. So um, through doing a bit of research on casein kinase 2, I found out that it stops apoptosis by blocking uh, capsaicin proteins or a family of enzymes that play a role in programmed cell death. Um, and I also found that elevated levels of casein kinase 2 are associated with increased cell proliferation or cell growth. Therefore, casein kinase 2 can be a possible target for cancer drugs as deregulation of apoptosis and cell proliferation are the key features of cancer cell biology. Uh, in conclusion, throughout the experience at the Waxman Institute Summer Experience Program, I was able to isolate, sequence, and publish six different clones from plating the cDNA library, um, performing polymerase chain reactions and restriction digest, and analyzing the clones using the DSAP program, I was able to effectively determine that my third clone, uh, Landoltia punctata clones sequence, coded for casein kinase 2. After doing research regarding the protein, I found that it is a serine threonine selective protein, protein kinase and is highly conserved throughout many organisms. Furthermore, it can be used as a possible target for cancer drugs as it is associated with both cell proliferation and apoptosis. Um, and finally, I would like to um, just give some acknowledgments. First, I would like to thank Dr. Vershawn and Dr. Mead for helping me throughout the program. Next, I would like to thank Ms. Finn, Ms. Van Horn, and Dr. Brinkman for helping me throughout my years at in during the science research program. Additionally, I would like to thank my classmates for always reviewing my work and showing me how to improve. Finally, I would like to thank my parents. Their endless love and support allowed me to pursue my interests in science. And um, that's it, thank you. Montville Township Public Schools. Educate, inspire, empower.